So, I want you to get up now. I want all of you to get up out of your chairs. I want you to get up right now and go to the window, open it, and stick your head out and yell, I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore! <laughs> Welcome once again to The Cinephiles, where each week we enter the world of a great film. We explore its themes, the history, the filmmaking, and the influence it has on us today. My name is Steve Morris. I'm a filmmaker and directing instructor in Los Angeles, California. Hello, everyone. My name is John Rocco. I'm a voiceover artist, host, writer, producer over at Collider, and uh, host of the, the new podcast, The Geek Buddies. It's out there for you to listen to, which Steve has become a massive fan of, and of course, the top 10 uh, that I do with Matt Nost. But uh, today is very, very special. John- so happy to be a co-host of the Cinephiles today. We are sitting in, I believe, the finest, classiest environment <laughs> that the Cinephiles has certainly, ever certainly. been lucky enough to record in, and that is because of our very special guest. Yeah. We are sitting in the studios of KCRW with Warren Olney, who's been a TV reporter for pretty much, or was a TV reporter and anchor on KCBS, KNBC, and KABC from 1966 to 1991. <laughs> that is a long time. Well, I didn't get to Los Angeles till 1972, but oh. I did begin in 1965, and did it up until I got sick and tired of it in 1991, and then came the Rodney King uh, riots, as it's described, the riots, the civil disturbance, the uprising, and I've been doing public radio ever since, and that's why you're here in the public radio station KCRW. That's right, and you've been doing uh, To The Point, which has been a show I've been listening to since I moved to Los Angeles, which is a show dealing with politics and the issues of the day, Mm -hmm. and I don't think I actually said your name, which means I did a terrible... I did? did? did. Oh, I did. But it I don't care. You can say it again. You it's buried right. the lead, but it's okay. <laughs> I need all the advertising I can, uh, I can uh, get. Well, then once again, our guest is Warren Olney, and thank you very much for coming on The Cinephiles. Thanks for having me. And I had one question before we get started, which is, I've been thinking about this quite a bit, is that, and listen, since I listened to your show, is that in this world that we have that seems to have grown more uh, angry and intense and polarized, I was wondering if it is difficult or how exactly you maintain that center, objective, dispassionate voice that I've heard you for all these years. Is it difficult? Yes, it is. Um, But it's a matter of learning how to do the craft. And I don't don't use the word objective. I think fair is a much better word, not to uh, make reference to Fox News. But um, I don't think anybody's objective. I'm not objective. I have my own views about politics. I care about it a lot. I started, I grew up with a a Republican father and uh, married to a a very liberal Democratic wife. And so Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'm all over the place. But uh, the idea, it seems to me, is to give everybody a voice, try to hear what they're saying, to understand as well as you can, the different points of view of people who are screaming at each other uh, in other venues, they're not going to do that on my program. That's that's just, and it's so good to have a voice like that in a place that we can turn uh, to your, which is still going as a podcast to, to the point to listen to this, you know, fair, really trying to be fair show. Well, it, I do try to be fair and I also try to learn and I try to listen because I care about it and I want to know what people think and why they think it. And sometimes I get people on who say things that are just outrageous to yeah. me. But my main response to that is, why the hell would you say that, you know? And why? how could you possibly come to a conclusion like that? That's getting easier and easier to ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, well, the film we are talking about today relates directly to this point, which is, uh, the film is Network by Patty Chayefsky, and this is one of the few times where a movie, the by credit normally in film, goes to the director. It's a film by Steven Spielberg, it's a film by Orson Welles, by Quentin Tarantino, by Stanley Kubrick, and in this case, that by credit, it says Network by Patty Chayefsky. Mm-hmm. And Patty Chayefsky is one of the great writers in the history of film, of theater, and of course of television, which is where he gets his start. Um, And so I just want to give a little bit of biographical information on him. He is the only person to have won three solo Academy Awards as a writer. There are other people that have won three, Woody Allen, Francis Ford Coppola, but they always uh, won some of them at least with other people. Um, Patty served in World War II, which is where he got his nickname. (laughs) And I just found out the story of his nickname, which is hilarious, which is he's trying to get out of KP during basic. And so he tells his uh, sergeant that he has to go to mass. 
Now, Patty is a Jewish kid <laughs> from Jew- Russian Jewish immigrant parents who grew up in New York, and the sergeant didn't buy it at all. So he gave him an Irish nickname from that point forward, and that is Patty, <laughs> <laughs> which I just love. Brilliant. Um, he came back home, and while he's working in his father's print shop, he started writing short stories, started writing radio plays, eventually moved on to TV, and his first show was for a TV show called Danger, and Danger was directed by Yul Brynner. Wow. Wow. Yeah, because Yul Brynner, before before he was the king, he was a well-known television director. And his assistant was a young Sidney Lumet. Wow. Yeah. And when he got the job as the king on Broadway, he said, Sidney, you're the only guy who knows anything. And Sidney Lumet took over being the main director uh, doing live television at the time and developed a close relationship with Patty Chayefsky. Hmm. Um, uh, one of his radio plays was Marty, which was in 1953. Yeah. And he had built into his contract that I get to write the screenplay for any movie that someone wants to make a screenplay of, which at that time had never happened. And we've talked about another one that came out of that, which was 12 Angry Men. One of yeah. our earliest shows also was a TV play that became a movie. And we talked about another one, which is Judgment of Nuremberg. Right. Judgment of Nuremberg. Three different TV plays from three of the great television writers of all time, all that got made into movies. And then... Um, and he comes to Hollywood. He writes Marty um, and uh, becomes- uh, Which wins Best Picture. Which wins Best Picture. And Ernest Borgnine wins Best Actor. Which I haven't seen in a long time. Really? I remember it It's being the shortest really good. picture to ever win a Best Picture. Is it? Yeah, shortest time. It's like 83 minutes. It's not that long. And then it wins Best Picture. It was really surprising, but a fantastic performance. Economy is something that more and more producers, directors, and uh, writers ought to be thinking about, it seems to me. A lot of, <laughs> a lot of things are just too long. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. Um, and uh, he also writes, starts writing for Broadway. Um, and then there's just one more thing about him I wanted to say, which is that he ended up in the early 80s in the hospital at the same time as Bob Fosse. Wow. Bob is in for open heart surgery. Patty's oh. in for chi- for cancer. Hmm. And they make a deal. And Patty says, listen, if you die first, I will deliver a stale, boring eulogy at your funeral. And if I die first, then you got to you got to dance at mine. <laughs> and on August 1st, 1981, Bob Fosse tap dances at Patty wow. Chayefsky's wow. funeral. Wow. Died at 58. Wow. Wow. It's just amazing the uh, account you gave of all of these people and these very familiar names and the relationships between them that you yep. didn't know about. You know, you think of them as sort of separate entities. Hmm. But in fact, they're all working together in one way or another. Well, and that's the remarkable thing, particularly about Sidney Lumet, is it seems as if, because he wasn't a Hollywood guy, he lived in New York, his whole, he liked to shoot New York, he only shot one movie in Hollywood, that he made these close ties with this New York group of people yeah. that he kept his whole life. Hmm. Um, I'll give a little bit about pre-production. Uh, it started, the whole thing started when, uh, a big corporation, I don't know which one was com- coming to buy out ABC and that's what gives Patty the idea. And he immediately calls up Howard Godfrey, his producer, and he calls up Sidney Lumet and says, Hey, would you want to do a movie about TV? And Sidney says, anytime you're ready to go, I'm ready to go. And it took about a year to write. Uh, Patty was buddies with John Chancellor at, uh, NBC. Oh, Wow. Yeah. Remember John Chancellor? Sure. And Sidney Lumet is buddies with Walter Cronkite at CBS. Wow. So the two not of them. Not bad were, connection. Yeah, not <laughs> bad at all. Well, and Walter Cronkite's <laughs> daughter is in network. Which she oh, has wow. one line. I didn't know that. She is, we'll get to it, but yeah. in the scene with the great Amon Khan when Lorraine Hobbs and all the lawyers are arguing about contracts, she is the Patty Hearst kind of character. <laughs> That's Walter Cronkite's daughter. So they finish the script. They have it's at UA. They have their first meeting there, and a VP of Business Affairs comes up to Patty and says, "I have some problems with the Howard Beale character." Patty Chayefsky walks out of the room. <laughs> um, That's all it took. Yep, and he was able to get away with that. He just it's for what I've heard is like he he didn't mind notes. He didn't mind, you know, having conversations about things. But in uh, Howard Godfrey's word, he didn't like to get fucked with. (laughs) (laughs) Who does? I mean, when the business affairs person comes up and says, I got a problem with your main character, we're in trouble. Um, And that's just about all the pre-production I have, Um, except for one thing, uh, which is casting. Uh, The casting director is Juliet Taylor. She is one of the great casting directors of all time. Listen to some of these movies. 
The Exorcist, Taxi Driver, Close Encounters, Terms of Endearment, Killing Fields, Heartburn, Biloxi Blues, Sleep, Sleepless in Seattle, Schindler's List, The Birdcage, and just about every Woody Allen film of the last 40 years. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So when you look at this unbelievable cast they get for this movie, you got to look at Juliette Taylor. Wow. Yeah. I mean, there's a reason, you know, it's not, a, it's not a role that we talk about as much as we should, but there's a reason that good cast get put together. And, and you it? understand from all that you said uh, how, how much it's a, a joint effort to put together any kind of production, but particularly a movie, a film. It's, it, it is, so much is involved. There is a reason my company's name is Team Effort Films. There you go. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. that's what it's all about. It's so incredible, too, when you look at this cast, watching it right in 2019. This is a 1976 film. How much of these actors you remember seeing right. as the years go on and are still working today? It's phenomenal. Conchata Farrell, I couldn't believe Conchata Farrell was in this movie. Who's she in that? Who's she? She's the uh, she's the assistant to Faye Dunaway, the kind of larger oh, lady with her right. hair. Oh, yeah. That's Conchata Farrell. Has been doing sitcoms for like nine hundred years, so I, I couldn't believe that she's in this in such well, a small Lance part. Lance Hendrickson shows up for like Lance Hendrickson thirty seconds, right? And um, I go to Three's Company. The guy who plays the director in the t in the booth, who's angry that all this is going on with the mustache, that's Jack Tripper's wife's father. So it's just like uh, it's like mind right. blowing. How well, many that's people why, are... where your memory yeah, is exactly. really. I have pages of notes. <laughs> I would never have remembered. And they all have it on their resumes. Uh, yeah, right. I would oh, in, you bet. Yeah, right. That's exactly. Film. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one more thing. They did three weeks of rehearsal for this movie, which was great for everybody. Mm except William Holden, who had never rehearsed in his entire career because he wasn't a theater actor. And lots of movies, rehearsals like, some like directors like it, some don't. William Holden's a movie star. Yeah. He showed up on the set, he knew his lines, and he did his part. Mm -hmm. So he didn't know what to do. And he said at the end of three weeks of rehearsal was the first time he felt like a real actor. Wow. Whoa. <laughs> and he's in some great movies. Mm -hmm. And a great actor. And a great actor. Even before <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. he thought of himself as a great actor. <laughs> Lumet said an interesting thing about him, which was that he he says he ca you cast people for the third act, which means that you don't look at where they have to start out. You look at where they have to go. Right. And he looked at William Holden and said, he has sad eyes. Wow. Yeah. Um, I love Sidney Lumet, by the way. He's one of my favorite directors. He's, you know, we have, we've talked about all these Angry, demanding, difficult, irascible, complicated directors. Lumet is down to earth. He's calm. He's kind. He's efficient. He plans ahead. He knows what he's doing. When they bring the DP on, the DP says, uh, looks at the script and goes, okay, I think we can maybe do this in 16 weeks. Lumet says, we're going to do it in 11. They did it in nine. Whoa. That is a director who knows what he wants. Economy. Yep. Knows what he's doing and just shoots what he has to shoot. And, and they lock picture five weeks after they finish shooting. It's not a lot of editing. Wow. No. Well, the script. You know, what is there to edit? I mean, if you get the lines right, that is, you don't have to change it. You don't have to mess with it. Well, and I looked at the original script, um, which I found, which is sort of fun because you could see the typewritten, you could see Patty's fingers, you know, that he hit this letter a little harder than that letter. And you could really feel it. He describes everything in detail. All It's all there in the script. Wow. It is pretty impressive. And Patty was on the set just about every single day, which again is very unusual for movies. Mm. Most of the time they don't like writers on the set because right. writers mess with the directors. Yeah. <laughs> um, would you like to get into the film? Well, first I'd like to find out when's the first time you saw oh, the film, right. which we I'm always sorry. do on this I've before. totally that's forgot right. what our yeah. main questions. Warren, do you remember when you first saw this film? I certainly do. It was in 1976, as you said earlier, and uh, I happened to have been in television at the time, and I'd been in it for quite a long time. And when I first came to Los Angeles, um, well, when I first started out in 65, television news was, you know, relatively respectable. You don't ever want journalism to be too respectable, but it was respectable, and it was covering what we refer to as news and, mean, you know, public affairs and holding public officials accountable for their actions and that sort of stuff, which was, it seemed to me, uh, the basic uh, reason for doing it. Channel 2, interestingly enough, was called KNXT at the time. I uh, had done a lot of uh, extraordinary production in the 60s, uh, which is now the subject of a Ph.D. thesis at uh, Yale Communications mm. School. As a matter of fact, they did, I don't know if you, this will make the final cut, but um, uh, Joe Saltzman, who's a producer worked with, who I worked with in 72, lucky enough to have him still at, uh, at the USC School of Journalism, uh, did a, a documentary called Black on Black in the mid-60s. It was the only first time 
that a network operation had done a major documentary with black people in it. Mm. It had only black people in it. That's remarkable. It was also without a narrator. It was uh, it edited in such a way that uh, one wasn't necessarily it was very advanced. Having, having edited time. documentaries, that's really hard. Yeah, mm. yeah. <laughs> well, he did another one called Junior High School. Mm-hmm. And similar, and a look at the junior high schools. It was anyway. I wanted to come to Los Angeles because I was still new in the business. I wanted to learn how to tell stories with pictures and sound, which seemed to be what was what it was all about. I had been in Washington, so I came to KNXT. It had the reputation of being the best news place in the uh, news station in the country. First hour long newscast, double the ratings of all the other stations combined at the time. Uh, and uh, it was it was a great place to be. So I started out here, as I say, in 1972. This is after having been in Sacramento for a while for the, their Sacramento Bureau. They had a bureau up there, mm. which was great for me. I got to learn about the state capitol. But um, when I came down, I was the political editor, and I did a lot of investigative reporting. I did some documentaries with Joe. They were hour-long features. And then things began to change. I really got there at sort of the last, moments of the real old school. halcyon days yeah. of television news. I was very, very lucky to arrive at the time. That Literally the moment that this movie is talking about. That's right. About. That's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. So in 1972, for example, I did an investigative report on a mortgage company that was advertising all over our station. Somehow, Joe and I found the uh, names and addresses of the happy couples that had been in the commercials. And we went to their homes, and I read to them what I had been shown, which was the small print in their contracts, which had all kinds of uh, deadlines and, right. fu- and mm-hmm. penalties and all Rate sorts changes of changes. And... The classic case was a woman in San Rafael who owned her house free and clear, a widow, borrowed a few dollars from uh, the union home loan, uh, and they ended up owning a house about, uh, I don't know, four or five years later, something like that. So anyway, these people on camera were going, you know, just overwhelmed when I would read them the, the uh, account. You know, what do you think about the the uh, company now? And you could hardly print their or run their their uh, responses without editing them. Hmm. So I was able to do that in 1972 right. and got away with it. And it cost the company, the station, a lot of money because they were a very heavy advertiser. Right. Very, very soon after that, a new management came in, the ratings had been going down a bit, and things began to change. And uh, new reporters came in, and they were involved, and in, they wanted to have what they called reporter involvement. And one of the examples of reporter involvement I remember very distinctly was when a new guy came in, and he went down to Marine Land, uh, and he was up on a tower with a fish in his teeth, and as right. the orca jumped up out of the water, the uh, he dropped the fish into the orca's mouth, and they were doing that kind of stuff. So... In 1976, yeah. here comes this film. I'm looking at it, and I'm saying, that's exactly what's happening. <laughs> and I'm living through it in, yeah. uh, in my own career. I mean, it's funny, because in, in, in looking about the reactions of people in television, it seemed to be, one, you're biting the hand that feeds you. Sure. How dare you? You, you guys started in network yeah. television. How dare yeah. you do this? And... The other people saying, that's exactly right. That's right. Yeah. Well, and there was tremendous uh, controversy about it within the profession. Sure. As you're suggesting. And, you know, are we playing piano at the wrong kind of place? Yeah. Uh, or are we, you know, holding the line and uh, and uh, maintaining the standards that we know we're dedicated to uh, despite the commercialization right. and the entertainment uh, orientation that we're seeing yeah. now? John, you remember how you first saw it? Yeah. Yeah. Um... I want to comment on this real quick. This is starting to happen in the entertainment world as well. Studios are starting now to put the foot down harder on the necks of uh, outlets and uh, newspapers and magazines that report on the studios and what they're doing and how they go about their financial dealings, their businesses, and who they get aligned with and things of that nature. And if you start to criticize an actor or a director or a producer you're starting to find that where before they would still have you give you access, they're starting to now limit access. Advertisers are now starting to say like, don't in, don't say anything negative about this studio because we won't advertise with you if you don't. So you're hearing these kinds of things. I uh, just off the uh, off the I don't know what you would say off the table. I guess if a reporter, uh, a friend of mine who's a, a reporter, talked to me about another reporter, another big organization who stepped away because 
his uh, boss came down to him and said, you can't write negative stuff about the studio anymore. And that's mind blowing to me because then at that point we're no longer journalism. At that point You're we're just essentially an advertising arm, right? We're state run TV for a for a for a uh, a studio or a production company, and that can't happen. And that's now happening at the home of the president and home and office of the president of the United States, Absolutely. where they are denying press credentials yes. now to longtime veteran reporters mm-hmm. of Washington. Uh, who have been going in there for years because they don't like what they're running. Well, and coming up with hoops for them to jump through that they yeah. can't. Like you have to be there certain, like nine days out of at twelve or something like. That. It's yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. Well, and and what this is why one of the things, and I was going to say this at the end, but I'm going to say it right at the beginning is, I wish Patty Chayefsky was here today <laughs> because <laughs> having that voice to analyze because what's happened today is things are so much more interconnected. Things are so much more corporately aligned. The messages that are being put out and the way they are being handled and Mm -hmm. algorithmed on social media and served out and programmed into our brains is so much more complex and devious than it was 40 years ago. One of the things that he was very interested in, it seems to me, and you see it in Hospital, which is another film he did that uh, you haven't mentioned, uh, is the dehumanization uh, that has gone on, and it seems to me that's exactly what you're uh, talking right. about. When all of a sudden you've got uh, algorithms, granted they are programmed by somebody originally, but then they kind of go off on their own. Yep. Apparently, right, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I came into I came to the film to come back to the question. Yeah. I came to the film uh, two years ago for the first time ever. I had always. It's one of those things where like I'd watched so many thousands and thousands of films, but this is the one that everyone said you got to see Network. You got, and I'm a natural rebel, and so when people tell me to see something too much. <laughs> I resisted for as long as possible. And then on uh, one day on TCM, I watched it. And I have to tell you, I was n- not floored by it. I was just like, oh, this felt like, oh, yeah, I've seen, yeah, of course, this makes sense. Watching it for the podcast this time, and I think because of the environment of our world now, as you mentioned uh, just a few seconds ago, Warren, uh, it became prescient and topical at the same time in a way that has never been, never was the first time I watched it. And I think the new HD remaster really helps it as well to get to see the real emotions that are going on so vividly within the actors. Because these speeches, these are this is essentially a film to play to a degree right. yeah. because there's such long uh, scenes well, in and one location. It's Shakespearean. In yes. The, the level of mm-hmm. erudition and the level of articulation yeah. of these actors in these huge, massive, Massive speeches. I don't know another movie that's like that. No, and the level of screaming. This is what my girlfriend eventually <laughs> couldn't handle anymore because she was just, she started for the first half an hour and then left the room and was like, babes, how can they keep screaming for two hours? I go, it's a very passionate time in the 70s. <laughs> 70s was very passionate. There was a lot going on. So, you know, so, but I, I thoroughly, thoroughly loved it watching it this time and understand why people were pushing me to see it for so long. So. Natural Rebel, you should be in the news business. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> He's working on it. Yeah, I am. I'm trying to break through. We'll see. All right. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't know when I first saw it. I saw this so young, probably junior high or before, on TV, and then rented it, and then rented it. And this is a movie I've watched over and over and over and over again. I This is a formative movie for me. The language, the the way the characters are framed, the, the poetry of the whole thing. I mean, like, there's so many times, if you went through and looked through Steve Morris's screenplays over the years, mm-hmm. you would go like, oh yeah. That's where that came from. That's where that came from. It's so influential to me. And in particular, the idea that you can have discourse on extremely important and philosophical topics handled in this intellectual and brilliant way, but also have real human passion and characters and a tremendous amount of humor all at the same time. This is this is a really big one for me. And one more thing I should say before we get into this film is the other reason we're doing Network today is because this is a request from one of our patrons. Simone Bouillard has one of the most interesting reasons for requesting a film in the history of the cinephiles. Here it is. Hi, Steve and John. This is Simone Bouillard. Uh, The reason why I chose Network is simply because I've never seen it before. And it's a movie that I can't wait to actually watch, uh, given that it's probably still uh, incredibly relevant today. So, well, that's it. All right. Thank you very much. Have a good day, guys. Okay, let's let's move into the movie. This story is about Howard Beale, who was the network news anchorman on UBS TV. We start with a narrator. And this is my first question. Why do you think Chayefsky chose to have this very almost storybook narration throughout this film? 
I suppose. Maybe he picked it up from television news. Mm. Mm. Oh, and, sure. Uh, uh, the, the, so often uh, we have the, or we used, we used to anyway, mm. uh, the, you know, the solemn anchor man on the, uh, on the desk uh, explains the background right. and uh, then introduces the story. Yeah. Uh, and he's a totally different, totally removed character. And it, yes. it seems to me that as a viewer, it keeps you sort of back from the action for a moment, even though, as he describes at the very outset, uh, these guys are sitting down to have a drink with each other and talk yeah. about how somebody's being fired. Mm -hmm. Well, um, and the phrase is, they got properly pissed, properly which pissed. is something yeah. that you would never hear an anchor uh, well, say. Well, there you are. And yeah. so that's, that's a wonderful twist on the on the uh, model. I also, I also think it's to give you the vibe that this is a pseudo documentary, mm. even though ah, it's got, you, if, you know, it has that feeling of like, he's going to guide yeah. you all the way through this and give you the background of it as it's occurring. Uh, so that's, that's the vibe I got. And again, so. very appropriate yeah. to the, what's coming up. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and the thing I think it does too, is that it, I think it allows you to laugh in a certain way. Like mm. this is a, this is, there is, I think it's doing those weird two things at once. It's exactly as you say, which is that this is the documentary, this is the news broadcaster, but it's also, let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a fairy tale almost, uh, a uh, a parable. You know, it's something that we can think about that's, that is real, but is yet not real, which is, I think, goes throughout this whole film, is that it is strikingly close to the bone in a lot of ways and also completely ridiculous or seemingly so. Um, and so we say these guys are going to go out and get drunk and we start with William Holden telling this story. And the story is about when he was a young reporter and they're building the lower deck of the George Washington Bridge and he didn't get there in time. So he gets up in his pajamas in the rain and rushes out and says to the cab driver, take me to the center of the George Washington Bridge. And the cab driver says, <laughs> he says, don't do it, buddy. You're a young man. You got your whole life ahead of you. <laughs> so this story's told twice in the film. Yeah. And it's so interesting to me because what do we see Howard Beale wearing at his most iconic moment in the film? Pajamas and a raincoat. Mm. The same thing that this story starts with. Oh, right. Interesting. Whoa. And so I just keep going like... But we are heading toward this moment, this out, the, the person doesn't knowing out, Ray in the middle of the thing. storm, yeah. rushing towards suicide. What was Howard Beale talking about at the beginning of the film? Is this suicide? Right, right. You know? This is where Patty Chayesky is just a genius. Wow, that's a great point. Hmm. A and the next thing we get to is them in the bar, and the first thing that Howard Beale says... I'm going to kill myself. Oh, shit, Howard. <sighs> I'm going to blow my brains out right on the air, right in the middle of the 7 o'clock news. Get a hell of a rating, I guarantee you that. 50 share, easy. <laughs> there used to be a time when someone would get a 50 <laughs> yeah, share. Right? Yeah, such a thing used to exist. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, William Holden, who's Max Schumacher, who is his producer and old, old friend, says, it's a great idea. Yeah. Execution of the week, terrorist of the week. The death hour. Great Sunday night show for the whole family. Wiped it fucking Disney right off the air. <laughs> Does this movie seem more ridiculous or less ridiculous today? It's topical to me. I, I would say it's absolutely on point today, and especially when you get to that ending. And we've heard for so many years about the possibility of certain things going on behind the scenes, certain conspiracies, certain things going forward, the possibility of what happens at the end. Nowadays, as we're becoming more and more of a violent society, as more and more school shootings, more and more access to guns, the, the things we have around weapons. We're not, I, we're not, I would argue we're not a more violent society. Okay. You yeah. argue we've always been this violent? Much more so. If you look at this era in the 70s, it was far more violent than today. Really? Oh yeah. Crime rates in New York City? Off the charts. Okay, to today. okay. Yeah. Remember, think about just- But where the crime rates is equal in all other cities across the nation. Oh, yeah. That's what I'm- If you I, think about- I don't the, remember school shootings being a big thing in the city. No, that didn't exist. Right. But that's a small percentage of- I mean, you think about like, mm. picture in your mind the French connection. Right. You know, that's the the, the crime levels were mm. much worse. Than, I mean, all, all of them are down today with the exception of mass shootings. Okay. They've gone up, ticked up a little bit in the last couple of years. Okay. But our perception of violence is much higher. Maybe that's a more uh, accurate statement than you. Yeah. 
Well, and I think the fact that our perception of violence is so much higher has a lot to do with the news media because mm, right. uh, as time has gone on, instead of doing the work that Thomas Jefferson supposedly thought the media were supposed to be doing, which was right. checking up on the elected officials, uh, we see more and more focus on crime. It's, uh, when I got to even Channel 2 at the time, uh, when it was supposed to be so hot, there was a guy named Carl Crime, and, and uh, he hung out at the LAPD uh, all the time, and, and he was always covering one uh, salacious crime story after another. But it wasn't the main focus. Now you look at local television, and that's what you see. Yep. Again and again and again and again, and particularly uh, focused on neighborhoods where minorities live. It's made it uh, easier uh, for uh, racists and uh, uh, haters to stereotype uh, the people that they hate hmm. because of the way they've been covered on local television. Because it's continually reinforced. That's right. You know, how often is it your ki kids could be dying at school, tune, tune in at 11. Yeah. Ooh, right. This must yeah. be really bad. By the way, my choice, whatever I hear something like that is, I am definitely not tuning in at yeah. 11. I do yeah. not want to know. Well, this is what Faye Dunaway essentially exactly right. lays the groundwork for what we see coming now, even 40 years, over 40 years later from this movie. She says that. There's a great story about film at 11 um, in San Francisco when the medium was beginning to really change. Uh, there was an anchor named Van Ehrenberg, and uh, he appeared uh, early in the evening saying, severed penis found at railroad track. News at 11. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it's not mine. <laughs> well, um, they never connected it. <laughs> there, oh, there it is. There it is. <laughs> so speaking of the news, it's about time to go on the air, and we have just a very ordinary lead up. It's a normal day at the office and we're prepping stories. And of course, we're hearing things about news of the day of Patty Hearst and Squeaky From, and they are heading off to the control room, which was shot at a real control room in Toronto because they really wanted it to be an actual television studio of which Sidney Lumet is live directing the actual mm. news show. Mm. Be and everyone's going, God, he's so good at this. How is he so good at this? Of course, that's where he started. He done it. He's having a ball, and Howard is on the air, and 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 the people in the control room are casual and gossiping about business and whatever, and they're not really paying attention because that's the way it really is. And then Howard gets on the air, and he says, "Ladies and gentlemen, I would like at this moment to announce that I will be retiring from this program in two weeks' time because of poor ratings. Since this show was the only thing I had going for me in my life." I have decided to kill myself. And no one in the newsroom quite notices it. Ten seconds to commercial. Oh, tune Thank in next sir. Tuesday. That should give the public relations people a week to promote the show. We ought to get a hell of a rating out of that. Well, tell 50 us share. Easy. It's only the two young people in yep. the room who notice it. The young producer on the other side of the window right. and the young lady there who's taking the notes with the glasses. Everyone else is just so bored just so bored with the situation they don't even notice it. And it takes them to bring well, it back. The news up. had become so routine, mm. you know, that the people in charge really didn't pay much attention, probably didn't watch at all. Mm. The general manager of the station, even the news director, you know, didn't pay all that all that much attention because what they were worried about was what the numbers were going to show mm. as soon as the numbers came up, which wasn't as often as they are now, you couldn't didn't get overnight ratings right. every single day. Mm. Well, we're sitting in your studio right now. If in the middle of your next broadcast, in the middle of it, you said, I'm going to kill myself, how long before the people over there would pick up on it? Well, that's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sorry to say that it's a good question. Uh, I just simply don't know, and I couldn't possibly answer it. <laughs> I hope that they're hanging on your every word. Well, you, I hope so, too. <laughs> um and then when they do get it, I love the sort of repeated, like they go out to the mic to talk to the into the studio and they, what the hell is going on, Howard? What the fuck's going on, Howard? They want to know what the fuck is going on, Howard. They just want to know what the fuck is going on, Howard. <laughs> I love that too. And they can't hear him. <laughs> and then finally they go, okay, get him out of here. And they start dragging him out of here. And you have the perfect <laughs> Howard throwing a punch just as we go to the technical difficulties. It's fantastic. Yeah. Um, and then we get to meet Robert Duvall. We've got a stockholders meeting tomorrow at which we're going to announce the restructuring of management plan. And I don't want this grotesque incident to interfere with that. 
He is on such a run at this point in his career. And this is, he shot this right about the time he's shooting Apocalypse Now. Because Apocalypse, this comes out in 76. Yeah. Apocalypse Now comes out in 79, but it took two years to edit. So it's right around the same time. It's just after Godfather 2. I mean, he is, and his performance in this is so crazy and so funny. And what they said about casting him is that this is exactly the opposite of who you would cast as the corporate guy. Mm. This sort of big, powerful, southern... You know, and yet it just works great. Emotional. Emotional. Yeah. It was beautifully cast. And I have to tell you that I recognized that guy <laughs> when I saw the film. That's sure. That's the people I'm working for. And this is the thing which, I, you know, we've experienced dealing with Hollywood and I'm sure you've experienced dealing with news is there's a lot of time you're like, why is that guy making the decision for me? He doesn't know anything about what I do or how this job gets done. He's looking, but he, but he's the person or she is the person that I have to please in order to do. Th That's why we do a podcast, to be honest, mm. is because the only people John and I have to please are us. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Well, when I was on set for Wind Talkers in 2000, when I first got here with John Woo, they had brought the production from, M from Hawaii back to Los Angeles because he was having cost overruns. So they had a person on set who was questioning every shot, yep. every uh, setup, everything. And he was walking around, older gentleman, white hair, got the military hat on, walking around, arms folded, never smiled, and was like, nope, we're not doing that shot. Okay, you're allowed to do this shot. Not, it was all about reining in the costs. And I had never seen that before. Coming out bright-eyed, wide-eyed kid, looking at John Woo, this master of cinema, being told what to do by this corporate penny pincher. And I was just shocked yep. that that was a thing. Yeah, they don't see it as art. Yeah. Right. No, of course. It's all commerce. Yeah. Um, and that's what's happening right in the scene, because the big thing is we got a big corporate board meeting coming up. And what are we going to say? And of course, Max says, Howard's been under great personal stress, et cetera. And instantly we see the argument between Hackett, the Frank, uh, the Robert Duvall character, mm. and Schumacher over who controls the news. I've got some goddamn surprises for you too, Schumacher. I've had it up to here with your credit division and its annual $33 million deficit. You keep your hands off my news division, Frank. And at this time, according to this film, it is, the news was sort of separate. It was known as a lost leader. It was required in terms of the broadcasting uh, rules that the news had to be put out. And it wasn't considered a thing that was entertainment, according to this film. That's accurate. And when I, after I was at CBS, I went to NBC. And when I was there, KNBC, here in another station owned by the by the network. And in fact, I worked for the network. I didn't work for the station. And there was resentment within the station of the fact that the news department was treated so differently mm. from the other right. parts of the station. And then as time evolved, of course, what uh, they came to understand was, A, they could make a lot of money on news. B, the uh, uh, fairness doctrine and the uh, controls by the FCC had gone away. And so all they have to do is sell time. And uh, news time became part of the, the wheel, just right. like every other kind of time. And all of a sudden, we were concerned about what our lead-in was and what was going to come up on later on the in the program. We would be assigned to do stories that, in some way, reflected the entertainment program and it would that would be coming up later, hmm. and they could tease to it on the news. You know, the way I always think about I always think hmm. about news is like your doctor because you need good news for your health. If the news is healthy, then our society is going to be more healthy. And I always imagine like, what if the doctor was worried about his lead-in? What if you went to the doctor and he changed his prescriptions based on some corporate thing other than your health or the society's health? You would go, well, I'm not going to see that doctor. I can't trust him. Mm -hmm. And yet that's exactly the situation we're in with certain you know, way back in network. Certainly it was the situation. And boy, it sure is the situation today. It sure is. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's meet Faye Dunaway. Um, this is her best performance in my mind. Mm. I think it's off the charts. And like Duvall, she is on a run from 67 with Bonnie and Clyde through, um, you know, Chinatown through, I mean, she's, it's an incredible run of film she's on. And the, the thing that Lumet said to her, he went to meet her at her Central Park West apartment or wherever it was. And he said, Faye, I know the first question you're going to ask me. And she said, what's that? The first question you're going to ask me is, where's her vulnerability? And my answer is, she doesn't have any. And that, and it's interesting because I don't know if I think that's entirely true, particularly when we get to the final scene with Holden. Mm -hmm. But the coldness, the heartlessness, the intensity, and the deep passion for 
TV is amazing to watch. But you're right about that last scene where having shown no sense of vulnerability whatsoever, mm. you just get a look on, it's really a look on her face. Yep. It's an extraordinary performance. And you think, wait a minute, maybe something's finally gotten to her. You know, Maybe there is an ounce of humanity left in this woman. And right here, what we're watching with her and Max Schumacher is a robbery of a bank, you know, staged by the Ecumenical Liberation Front or something, which is the, you know, a a reference to Patty Hearst. The The Sibionese Liberation Army. Yeah. Um, And the great Amon Khan. And there's the Patty Hearst character in the robbery. And Diane thinks this is the greatest thing she's ever seen. This is terrific stuff. And this is a thing you'll see Patty Chayefsky do throughout this film, which is there's two things going on. While she's watching this film, Max is taking calls about Howard. Mm. And Howard is calling to say, give me another chance. Oh, come on, Howard. I have 11 years of this network, Max. I have some standing in the industry. I just don't want to go out like a clown. It'll be simple, dignified. You and Harry can check the copy. Well, okay. And no booze today, Howard. No booze. No booze this time. Yeah. Well, what's great in this moment, too, or in the scene, is that you see Faye Dunaway essentially creating reality television. In that it's moment. hundred percent what Let's, this is. We got to get a camera. Like, later, like, this is the beginning in her mind, because she'll do this later in the office. We got to get a camera on these people. We got to put this out. We can create a whole series around these people, stealing stuff or robbing stuff and whatever. We're not going to stop them. We're just going to film them. And right. it's just like, uh, and we're just going to control the situation. And you're, this is the beginning of reality TV that we see now. That's that's absolutely mm-hmm. right. Yeah. Um, and, and just as you say, John, we move into a scene with her mm-hmm. staff, including, what was the woman's name again? Conchata Farrell, yeah. Could, suiting, where, where she's pitching this, let's go, f- this is great stuff, I want more of this. And they are completely bewildered. What are we talking about? Look, we've got a bunch of hobgoblin radicals called the Ecumenical Liberation Army who go around taking home movies of themselves robbing banks. Maybe they'll take movies of themselves kidnapping heiresses, um, hijacking 747s, bombing bridges, assassinating ambassadors. Well, we'd open each week's segment with that authentic footage, hire a couple of writers to write some story behind that footage, and we've got ourselves a series. What are we going to call it? The Mousy Tongue Hour? <laughs> Why not? And that becomes the name. <laughs> um, and she, she just rips them to pieces. And this is what is weird about this movie is on the one hand, what she is proposing, I think most people watching this movie go, this this is terrible, mm. this is awful. And yet she is so convincing and she seems so right that you go along with it. You are in this weird way rooting for this thing that you know is bad for you. Uh, I've ne- I've never root for her. No way in shape or form. <laughs> really? I, I think it's horrible what she's pitching and completely, and what she does to the staff when she closes that door. This is the thing. She doesn't. She doesn't have a vulnerability in that moment, but she's very clear about what she's want. What she oh, wants, yeah. and she takes no joy uh, in destroying these people or threatening their jobs. It's just matter of fact, and that's almost more unsettling because um, there's a sociopath element to that where there is no human connection here. This is the, what needs to get done. If you can't get it done, your jobs are on the line. I'll find people who can. You're just like, whoa. I, I think. I think what I mean is that. What she says, I think, is so true. has a truth to it hmm. that is persuasive. So what she says is... They've got Strike Force, Task Force, SWAT. Why not Che Guevara and his own little mod squad? Look, I sent you all a concept analysis report yesterday. Did any of you read it? Well, in a nutshell, it said, the American people are turning sullen. They've been clobbered on all sides by Vietnam, Watergate, the inflation, the depression. They turned off, shot up, and they fuck themselves limp, and nothing helps. So... This concept analysis report concludes the American people want somebody to articulate their rage for them. Right. And I think you go, yeah. And by the way, I think we still have people articulating people's rage today. Mm-hmm. Look at and, 19, uh, 2016. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, and look at today. Look at, you know, turn on, and, I, and not to take any political stance on this at all, mm. turn on whichever version of reality you don't like. Or turn on whichever version of reality you do like, and you will find people trying to articulate your rage. Even in sports. Stephen A. Smith makes a whole career out of this on ESPN. Well, making even six nerd- million a year. Think about all the nerd stuff and yeah. geek Same movie thing. stuff. You have people articulating their rage about Star Wars and Marvel mm-hmm. comics and Game of Thrones every single day. Yep. Of course, that's always been the function of satire. 
Absolutely. Is to do that, Jonathan Swift uh, he was enraged. Right. Yeah. Uh, did it in a different in a different kind of way. But I'm interested in what you said about uh, whether you buy into her argument mm. uh, about uh, the Mao Zedong Tungar. It seems to me that it's a real challenge there to the fact that we have, to such an extent, adopted commercial values. Mm. Yeah. And if in fact those are your values. And that's what you want to uh, make make real. Hmm. Then you, you go for the biggest ratings that you can possibly get, whatever it takes. Right for her, it does. And that's the whole point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, and this is the basic, you know, thesis of Patty Chayefsky's network: right. is if dollars drive you, then you drive wherever the dollars take you. With and and the, if that is your only value, you know, if the if the basic rule of corporations is that they owe a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholder, then that becomes the top priority, whether it's environment or where they choose how they treat their workers or mm. where they ship their jobs or anything else. It all takes second place to the fiduciary responsibility of the shareholders, and that is pretty much Ned Beatty's argument later in the film. Yeah. Um. So she kicks out all those people, and we head off to a shareholder meeting where uh, Frank Hackett Duvall is making a speech. And he is talking about making the news division responsible to management. Mm -hmm. And everyone is clapping and the camera moves over to Max Schumacher, who has suddenly found out that the news division that he thought was his holy place that he had control over, he might not have control over. And this is so key because for everything that has to happen in this film, you have to emotionally put Max Schumacher, the William Holden character, in a position that he allows it to happen. Mm. If he is not in this emotional state, he will not allow Howard Beale to do what Howard Beale does. And he goes up to his boss and says, I want to talk about it. And the boss says, we'll talk about it at tomorrow's meeting, which Schumacher takes to mean you're, you're fucked, mm -hmm. um, which may or may not be what it means. And we go directly to the control room and there is Howard Beale where he is going to make up for it because he doesn't want to go out that way. And so what we think we're going to hear or what the people in the control room think they're going to hear is an apology. I shouldn't have said that. I'm obviously not going to kill myself and I'm really sorry. And let's make every, you know, maintain the surface facade of the respectable news organization. And that is not what Howard Beale is going to do. To you, Howard. Good evening. Today is Wednesday, September the 24th, and this is my last broadcast. Yesterday, I announced on this program that I was going to commit public suicide, admittedly an act of madness. Well, I'll tell you what happened. I just ran out of bullshit. And this time they listen. Oh, yeah. Control yeah. Boom. This time they're awake mm. and hear that. And immediately go, cut them off. Right. And yet at that moment, who has walked into the control room? Max Schumacher, having just come from his boss, who confirmed for him that the news division was taken away, that his whole life work has been destroyed, that the news has been disrespective. And so what does he say? Leave him on. Am I still on the air? If this is how he wants to go out, this I is how I know the way to say it. I think that is an amazing moment. It's a great moment. Yeah. And, and obviously a recognition by him of his powerlessness on the one hand, and on the other hand, a recognition of how right they are, because if they keep him on, his ratings are going to go up. Hmm. Well, I, well, this is what this is this bizarre paradox of yeah. this movie, right. and so it's this weird sort of fuck you to the network, and also, you know, if here's my friend wants to do this, he wants to do it, and Howard says, "Bullshit is all the reasons we give for living, and if we can't think of any reasons of our own, we always have the god bullshit." Holy Mary, mother. What he says here is so remarkable <laughs> and so funny. We don't know yeah, why Tom, what is going it? through all this pointless pain, humiliation, and decay, so there better be someone somewhere who does know. That's the God bullshit. And what's amazing, too, is that this is all being intercut with the reactions within the control room mm -hmm. of people calling up saying, get him off the air, get him off the air. And so you have to interweave this amazing monologue from Howard Beale with the real panic in the control room about what's going out to, you know, 60 million Americans. Mm -hmm. and, and I love the moment where, uh, you know, he's getting the call from the guy and, and Max's response is, he's saying that life is like bullshit and bullshit. it is. So what are you screaming bullshit. about? Man is <laughs> it's like, this is the news. I mean, we're just reporting, it's reporting the news it. here. Yeah, that's right. But life is bullshit. Finally got back to what we're here for in the first <laughs> This place. is actually the truth. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think anyone who takes a good look at how the world works, 
they have to at some point conclude like, oh my God, this yeah. is all bullshit. Yeah. There's a lot of bullshit going he, on. He's attacking the constructs and the pillars of our society all in one speech. Yeah. And and the God the God one is like, and especially in the mid 70s, I wonder how that uh, people must have been going insane of that in the theaters having that attacked. But oh, yeah. it's what was going on because what we're only a few years away from the counterculture revolution in the 60s into the early 70s and all that so these are these are now thought processes that are in the mainstream uh conversation with people so i, I find that to be incredible in, well, in the and, monologue and the peter finch max schumacher generation this is the world war ii generation right this is the generation that built these structures that these edifices of how the world mm. was supposed to work that were logical and made sense and didn't see the cracks you know, which, you know, come out in the 60s in the movement and in the 70s. And it's like, oh, yeah. this, there are a lot of cracks here. The term is often used prescient to describe this film. And if you consider what's going on today, there's it's absolutely appropriate mm. word. And to think that he did this, he figured this out yeah. and had this vision in 1976. Really quite extraordinary. Well, and it's, mm. people let him say it. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Everybody got on board and said, "Yeah, yeah. do have these long monologues yeah. about politics mm. and attacking the basic edifices of society. Go yeah. for it. Let's do it." Well, but in the way that they did it, though, and with you know, he's saying it, other people are reacting, uh, so you get sort of a, a horrified reaction, and you hardly notice. What is he saying? God bullshit? Excuse me? You know, all of right. a sudden he just gets away with it. You know, it right. happens. Well, if there's anybody out there that can look around this demented slaughterhouse of a world we live in and tell me that man is a noble creature, believe me, that man is full of bullshit. Completely attacking American, the idea of American exceptionalism. Sure. Right. And all just sorts completely. of other stuff. All yeah. sorts of other stuff. Yeah. 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 Well, and what's the reaction in the studio? They laugh. Yeah. yeah. What's so goddamn funny? I can't help it, Harry. It's funny. I don't... Because it's funny. Yeah. And this is like this thing, you know, that comedy is serious stuff. Satire, this is a serious movie that is really, really funny. Mm. There's also a great line because you're going back and forth between the drama in the control room and what Howard Beale's saying. So we miss a lot of what he's saying. And they managed to come back to him at these moments. And one of them is he says, And I was married for 33 years of shrill, shrieking fraud. And that line's just, it's just out there. We don't know. Much of, we know that he's just gotten divorced from his wife, mm. or his wife has just died, I think. Yeah. And we, so we know that's something. We know he's been depressed and that the depress has led to a loss of ratings. But shrill, shrieking fraud. There is a way that the English language works that is beautiful. And just those three words, shrill, shrieking fraud, and you hear it throughout Patty Chavsky's writing, is he has a love of words, a love of the sound of words and how they fit together. That is, again, I don't make the Shakespeare comparison lightly or often, but this is one where I like, this dude understands language hmm. and how to use it. Mr. Hackett's trying to get through to you. Tell Mr. Hackett to go fuck himself. And we end with... So I don't have any bullshit left. I just ran out of it, you see. And he smiles. I think he feels really good at this moment. <laughs> he finally like, gets to say what he thinks. I get mm -hmm. to say what I think. Yeah. You've been doing this. You've been on microphones and in front of cameras for a really long time. Do you have this feeling sometimes? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, when I was in television, I was never a full-time anchor, but I would do uh, substitute anchoring from time to time, um, which I didn't like much. Um, <laughs> in fact... I was at a restaurant one night, and a woman came up to me and said, you know, I saw you anchor the news tonight, and you looked like you were in pain. <laughs> and uh, I was, because what happens is, or what happened in those days, was you get up and you're reading somebody else's copy hmm. about a story you don't really know anything about, and that the person who wrote the copy probably didn't know anything right. about either. Hmm. Uh, and it has very hard to to do that and do it persuasively, without at least having in some way, and I guess, unfortunately for me, I did, and it showed on my face, I thought it was bullshit. <laughs> it's, it must be so hard. I mean, because sometimes it's just the job. Your job is to, this is what you got to yeah. say at this moment. Yeah. Um, and I should say something about Peter Finch. Lumet was against hiring him at first. Wow. Yeah. And the reason is, is that Finch is Australian. Oh. And a great actor. Uh, and it acted tons on the stage in London. And, you know, and he's like, the guy's fantastic, but... The anchor is an American role, yeah. like, and he didn't know that he could do it. And Chayefsky wanted Peter Finch. And so they call up Finch and Finch says, send me a videotape of Walter Cronkite and a copy of the New York Times. 
Two weeks later, they get a videotape of Peter Finch reading the entire New York Times with a perfect American accent. And they go, okay. Mm. We go back to a, a meeting with Hackett and uh, Max is there and the president of the network is there. And what they're trying to damage control this whole thing. And the main result of it is that Max gets fired now officially. And then they go, hey, does anyone know where Howard Beale is? And of course, he's down there talking to reporters, mm -hmm. looking as happy and as comfortable as we've seen him in the whole movie. <laughs> well, every day, five days a week for 15 years, I've been sitting behind that desk, the dispassionate pundit, reporting with seemly detachment the daily parade of lunacies that constitute the news. And just once, I wanted to say what I really felt. And then we see this on TV. And who is watching this TV but Faye Dunaway with... Uh, a lover, presumably, and she's basically says, knock it off. She's knock it off, yeah. <laughs> I don't think she seems like a fun girl to date. Well, she, yeah. <laughs> she controls everything. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and has very little attention for her. Oh, of course. Yeah. Once she gets her, she's done. Well, and she and all she what she cares about is TV. Yeah, TV. That's Truth it. is not her concern. No. <laughs> no. Nor nor love or connection or human compassion <laughs> or a whole bunch of other stuff. <laughs> that we might think might be important to a person. Um, it's the next day and the ratings have, p have come in. Hey, that went pretty well. And Diane wants a meeting with Hackett, which she gets, and she goes in to have the meeting and she shows him the ratings and the editorials of the New York Times. And Duvall is looking at her like she is crazy. Oh, for God's sakes, Diane, are you suggesting we put that lunatic back on the air yelling bullshit? Yes, I think we should put Beale back on the air tonight and keep him on. And again, you put these words into her mouth that are so articulate and so amazing. Frank, that dumb show jumped five rating points in one night. Tonight's show has got to be at least 15. We just increased our audience by 20 or 30 million people in one night. Now, you're not going to get something like this dumped in your lap for the rest of your days, and you can't just piss it away. Howard Beale went up there last night and said what every American feels, that he's tired of all the bullshit. He's articulating the popular rage. Which is what she had said she wanted before, mm. articulating the popular rage. I want that show, Frank. I can turn that show into the biggest smash on television. What do you mean you want that show? It's a new show. It's not your department. I see Howard Beale as a latter-day prophet, a magnificent messianic figure inveighing against the hypocrisies of our times, a strip Safonarola Monday through Friday that I tell you, Frank, could just go through the roof. I had to look up Safonarola. <laughs> <laughs> He's a Renaissance-era cleric who was known for his uh, big speeches. I didn't know what that was. I'm talking about a $6 cost per thousand show. I'm talking about a hundred, a hundred thirty thousand dollar minutes. Do you want to figure out the revenues of a strip show that sells for a hundred thousand bucks a minute? One show like that could pull this whole network right out of the whole network. Frank, it's being handed to us on a plate. Let's not blow it. That's reality television. Mm -hmm. That is, you are a hundred percent right. It's that you think about like Game of Thrones today, which is you know the biggest mm -hmm. show on TV, but it costs fifteen to twenty million dollars an episode. Yeah, this costs nothing. Right. That was the you know that's Big Brother, that's Survivor, that's American Idol. It's these cheap shows that you can get everybody to watch. As soon as that writer strike happened in the mid '90s, all of a sudden they sh they flooded the airways with these reality shows because they were cheap to produce. They could work non-union and they didn't have to pay actors anything. They paid those people a certain amount and they was done. I, I worked on a couple of them and it's mind blowing what they do on those things to create entertainment. It's it's not in any way, shape, or form a reality show. And when the networks. Uh and the local stations began to realize that uh, you could make money with news. A lot of people were watching. Oh, yeah. Then they began looking at the uh, cost of production. And my God, the cost of production, as you're saying, mm. by compar the comparison to even the entertainment shows of the day, nothing. Yeah. Yep. Nothing at all. So jack it up. Frank, let's not go to committee on this. It's 20 after 10. We want Beale in that studio by half past six. We don't want to lose the momentum. For God's sakes, Diana, we're talking about putting a manifestly irresponsible man on national television. His main thing is, well, I've got to have to check it out with legal. And when someone says, I'm going to have to check it out with legal, you got him. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes upstairs to the big board meeting, which is, mm -hmm. by the way, this was all shot at the MGM had a building in New York that had three empty floors. The entire movie shot on location. They all shot it on these. And the thing about it, it, it 
Something you don't see, particularly in movies at the time, is those there are windows in every scene where you're seeing those New York streets. And Lumet had an approach to lighting this film, which is that he wanted it to start off completely realistic. That means minimal lighting, almost all natural light as much as he could, nothing trying to be dramatic. You have these sort of broadly lit scenes in the newsroom that are very simple. And as the movie progresses, he wanted to shift it to more, he called it corrupting the camera, that the camera movement and the lighting changes into becoming more dramatic, more movie-like as the story goes on. And this is the same thing we saw because uh, John and I did 12 Angry Men as one of our really early podcasts, mm -hmm. one of your favorite movies of all time. Absolutely. And he did the same thing, which is that movie starts off in wide shots mm -hmm. and uh, and ends up in long lenses and that he changes it and it starts off light and ends up dark and, and he changes it step by step through the course of the film, his approach to shooting a film, which is just... Brilliant. And Thank you hard. for saying that. I, I, that's a wonderful perception about the about the film, and it makes me understand better how it functions and how it appeals and, yeah. and how it works over time. Well, well, because and this is a thing which he doesn't want anybody in the audience to go. Oh, I noticed that the lighting has become more dramatic as we moved on. <laughs> no, that's course. not the point. Yeah. The point is that it, it just feels different. Yeah. But right now we're still very much in this naturalistic. Uh, lighting in the real dining room of MGM on the you know 18th floor or whatever of this building. I like this scene because he's not really trying to convince the other executives that he's doing it. He's doing this. Mm -hmm. And they have an objection that's saying, well, you know, we, we're a respectable network. We can't do a thing like this. And he says, we're not a respectable network. We're a whorehouse network. And we have to take whatever we can get. Well, I don't want any part of it. I don't fancy myself the president of a whorehouse. That's very commendable of you, Nelson. Now sit down. Your indignation has been duly recorded. You can always resign tomorrow. He tells them the reality of the situation. Even though they're caught up in thinking they're, they're important people in an important situation, he said, no, here's the truth. We're losing money, so you can grandstand and feel grandiose about things, but you can be out of a job real soon, or you can get on board and make money with this situation, swallow your pride, because this is the only way out to keep your job. And it's a hard pill for all of them to swallow, especially what's his face, uh, the Rody. Yeah. Well, they're two white haired Network guys. President. Yeah. yeah there's that, that I never remember which one is. He which. was in the verdict, by the way. Oh, really? He's the doctor that they're suing. Oh, that's on, with on the James stand? Mason. Yeah. We got to do that movie too. Uh, we do. Yeah, that's a great movie. Fantastic. That's Sidney Lumet, I think. It's as well. also Lumet. Yeah. Yes. No, Sidney Lumet is. He's great. Yeah. Here's the thing I think that's interesting too, and it, it, we sort of t touched on it a little bit before. Is on the one hand. We don't like Frank Hackett. Like, right. he is the corporate asshole who's looking at his money as the bottom line. He's the guy who's firing Max Schumacher. He doesn't have any values beyond money. We don't like him. We don't want him to succeed. On the other hand, we want more Howard Beale. Yeah. So we as the audience kind of like him shutting these people down because we want to get the thing we want to get, even though that's not what we want to get. <laughs> But this is what, I mean, this is how good movies work sometimes. That's how good television works, too. Giving yeah. you what you didn't know you wanted. Even well, though you thought you didn't well, want it, you actually do. Well, it's a, a, you know what the best example of this in TV, I think, is? Is Breaking Bad. Is right. that this is a horrible person sure. who's going to become increasingly horrible, and that is what we want to see. Mm. We don't want him to be a school teacher and die of cancer. We want him to be a horrible <laughs> drug dealer and murder people. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's, or, or Hannibal Lecter. We like seeing Hannibal Lecter do mm. terrible things. Once again, that's that paradox that we've talked about before, where on the one hand, you're being told and you understand that what have, is happening with uh, Beale is just a terrible thing and what the corporation is doing is a terrible thing. But wait a minute, in some sense, they're right, right, because just as much as the audience was tuning in to see him, mm. you want to see it too. Yeah. Well, I, I, we can even call this just the rubbernecker philosophy is, you yeah. know, your freeway is going shorter and it's sure. messing you up because everyone's looking at that thing. But when you get close, I kind of want to see too, you know? Uh, <laughs> so Max has been fired. He's packing up. He and Howard are reminiscing about the good old days with Edward R. Murrow and Cronkite and the boys. And they start laughing and telling stories. And Howard is wearing a fantastic 70s black turtleneck. <laughs> it's really good. And they're laughing and joking together. And a guy comes in and asks what's funny. And suddenly the whole newsroom is there. And he is once again telling that joke mm -hmm. about the George Washington Bridge. And everyone is laughing. And then one of the producer guys comes in and say, hey, do you want to see, hear, hear something really funny? I've just come back from Frank Hackett's office, and he wants to put Howard back on the air tonight. You're kidding. <laughs> no, apparently the ratings went up five points last night, 
And he wants Howard to go back on and do his angry man thing. And that guy is uh, the uh, the lawyer against Joe Pesci in My Cousin Vinny. That's oh, that actor. Because so I kept looking at all him. These, these worked forever, these guys. I kept looking at him going like, he looks like young Joe Don Baker or something. Mm, he looks a little bit. But that's, that's not him. who it is, yeah. And then we get into this thing of like, they want him to be an angry prophet denouncing the hypocrisy of our time. And what's wrong with being an angry prophet denouncing the hypocrisies of our times? <laughs> what do you think, Max? Do you want to be an angry prophet denouncing the hypocrisies of our times? Yeah, I think I'd like to be an angry prophet denouncing the hypocrisies of our times. <laughs> I love how much they say that in this yeah. scene. It's a brilliant, it's a brilliant <laughs> use of language. Yeah. And, and, and I love even the president of the network. You think that he's going to be on the moral side on some level. But his reason of letting this happening is that he thinks Hackett's overstep himself and he's going to hang himself with this thing. And so he wants it to happen to destroy his corporate enemy. Ah, yeah. There's not a lot of places that we can feel good about a moral core here, including Max, who's mm -hmm. probably the most, but he's the old guy who's going to go off and have an affair on his, you know, right. so we're not going to feel that great about him either. But unfortunately, it doesn't work that well. Our narrator comes back and says, you know, he ratings are kind of poor and maybe this isn't going to work. Chayefsky delays us getting to the thing that we want mm -hmm. for a long time. Because we think, oh, now it's going to start. No, it's not going to start. And Diane goes to see uh, Max. It's late at night. And now it's where we see the lighting start to become a little bit less realistic, a little bit more romantic. Mm. And she talks to him about this fortune teller she met, strangely enough, named Sybil the Soothsayer. <laughs> so I called her this morning and asked her how she was on predicting the future. She said she was occasionally prescient. For example, she said... I just had a fleeting vision of you sitting in an office with a craggy middle-aged man with whom you are or will be emotionally involved. And you see that look from Max? And then she kind of moves on and says that she's interested in Howard Beale. Nice to uh, kvetch you. He's being irascible. We want a prophet, not a curmudgeon. He should do more apocalyptic doom. I think you should take on a couple of writers to write some Jeremiads for him. I see you don't fancy my suggestions. Well, you're not serious, are you? No, oh, I'm serious. The fact is, I could make your Beale show the highest rated news show in television if you'd let me have a crack at it. What do you mean, have a crack at it? I'd like to program it for you. Develop it. I wouldn't interfere with the actual news itself, but TV is showbiz, Max. And even the news has to have a little showmanship. And he is somewhat indignant. My God, you are serious. And her response, and this goes to everything we've been talking about, is... I watched your 6 o'clock news today. It's straight tabloid that you had. A minute and a half of that lady riding a bike naked in Central Park. On the other hand, you had less than a minute of hard national and international news. It was all sex, scandal, brutal crime, sports, uh, children with incurable diseases, and lost puppies. So I don't think I'll listen to any protestations of high standards of journalism. Now, you're right down in the street soliciting audiences like the rest of us. Look, all I'm saying is, if you're going to hustle, at least do it right. She nails it. Boy, she does. And, and I, I mean, I haven't put a stopwatch on. I, haven't wa I don't watch local news, but I haven't put a stopwatch on a local news show in a long time. But my guess is that breakdown's pretty good. Mm. Just add a couple yeah. of minutes for the weather. Oh, absolutely. You know? <laughs> yeah. And it took a very short time for that to b happen. Yeah. It evolved very quickly in starting out in the in the late seventies, or excuse me, the uh, late late sixties when things were pretty good. Mm -hmm. And by the time Patty Shavsky, uh took a look at it in nineteen seventy six, we had something very different. Yeah, and he thought that. She was come, talking to him about a relationship with a cracky middle-aged man. Yeah. And I love her response. Oh, I wouldn't rule that out entirely. And what he says is, All right, Diana, you bring up all your ideas at the meeting tomorrow, because if you don't, I will. I think Howard's making a goddamn fool of himself, and so does everybody that Howard and I know in this industry. It was a fluke. It didn't work. So tomorrow... Howard goes back to the old format, and all of this gutter depravity comes to an end. Then he asks, why did you even, if you were going to go to the meeting anyway, why, did, why even come down here? Why have this conversation? And she says, well, because of this schoolgirl crush that she had on this distinguished journalism when she was at the University of Missouri. I uh, think I 
once gave a lecture at the University of Missouri. I was in the audience. I had a terrible schoolgirl crush on you for a couple of months. And again, he asks about emotional involvements in middle-aged men. And there's a great reaction from her. And she picks up the phone. I can't make it tonight, love. Call me tomorrow. And they look at each other. You have a favorite restaurant? I eat anything. (laughs) That's so true. There's so many levels to that. (laughs) And he says, Son of a bitch, I get a feeling I'm being made. You are. (laughs) She never lies. Nope. She's always straight up. (laughs) And he says, I've got to warn you, I I don't do anything on my first date. We'll see. (laughs) And I love, as he walks to get his coat, he says, Schmuck, what are you getting into? (laughs) Right. It's great. Good stuff. Fan, Really good stuff. Um, and we're out at a restaurant, which is, by the way, Elaine's in New York, yeah. which rarely has a film was a film ever shot at Elaine's. And this, of course, was the place for celebrities at yeah. that era of time. I think it closed in early 2000s. Did you ever go to Elaine's? I never did, but I knew people who did. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> talked to them about it. And she has a long monologue about her marriages and therapists and that she's everyone she's had sex with says she's a lousy lay. I can't tell you how many men have told me what a lousy lay I am. I apparently have a masculine temperament. I arouse quickly, consummate prematurely, and can't wait to get my clothes back on and get out of that bedroom. And that was that was really... Pretty advanced st- stuff in terms of mm-hmm. the kind of uh, uh, thing that audiences will tolerate and that uh, uh, people who censor one way or another will uh, draw attention to. And I don't think I don't think it really resonated. I don't think anybody nailed them for that, did they? Not as far as I know. Yeah. Not as far as I know. I don't remember seeing a film before that. It I'm... had anything that candid about mm-hmm. uh, sexual behavior and activity and the way people think about it. Mm-hmm. You know, I think when you mm-hmm. when you have a movie that has so much that's out there, you got to kind of pick and choose. Yeah. You know, when the biggest, loudest thing is the guy crawling, crying bullshit about national TV, and then we have terrorists that are being filmed as television. Sure. Maybe this stuff they don't even pay attention to. Yeah, yeah maybe uh, like Carnal Knowledge, maybe, or Bob and Carol, yeah. Ted and Alice, maybe those films had kind of yeah, broached the subject. Yeah. And yeah. then this is like a really, almost like a mainstream film. Yeah. Speaking yeah. about it with these esteemed actors. And then she says, I seem to be inept at everything except my work. I'm good at my work. So I confine myself to that. All I want out of life is a 30 share and a 20 rating. Um, and to take a moment here, like this is a woman in the 70s. Right. In a male dominated industry. With an older, powerful man. Right. Who is, yep. What absolutely. it must, like, I would love to know who Patty based this character on, where he created this character or found this character, or maybe someone sparked this uh, idea of his to create this kind of character. So after the film came out, apparently there were all sorts of people in all sorts of network <laughs> television jobs who said that was based on me. Of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> but as far as I know, <laughs> None of them are. Um, right. And we hear a little bit about Max's life. He's you know married 25 years. He has one daughter going into college, one daughter who's pregnant. And then uh, she asks if his wife's out of town, and he says no. And she says, well, we better go to my place then. Mm. So, yeah, he was being made. Yeah. Allowing himself to be made. Yes. Yes. Willingly. Oh, willing. Willing. Uh, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, there, there, there's no question from the moment I think she walks in and says the thing about the craggy middle-aged man, he's not going to be putting up much of a mm-hmm. argument on this one. Um, Howard is lying in bed. A light is on his face. <laughs> I love this scene. And the camera is slowly pushing in, and he is speaking to an unseen <laughs> voice and says, yes, I hear you, yes, yes. And then he says, why me? I said, why me? And then there was an almost beatific smile on his face. And he says, Okay. Next day, we're in the newsroom. And Max tells Howard, I'm killing the whole screwball Andy Prophet thing. Tonight, we go back to straight news. So I guess it's done. Uh, We're in the control room. And everyone says, Howard's been great. He's been funny. Everything's been fine. Uh, And then we put him on camera. And Howard says, Last night. I was awakened from a fitful sleep shortly after two o'clock in the morning by a shrill, sibilant, faceless voice. It's interesting that the word is shrill because that is how he described his wife. Mm. 
Oh, his uh, marriage. His marriage. His marriage. He never specifically Fair says point. my wife. Fair yeah. point. Yeah. Uh, and he says, I want you to tell the people the truth. Not an easy thing to do because the people don't want to know the truth. And I said, you're kidding. What the hell should I know about the truth? But the voice said to me, don't worry about the truth. I will put the words in your mouth. And I said, what is this, the burning bush? For God's sake, I'm not Moses. And the voice said to me, and I'm not God. What has that got to do with it? And the voice said to me, we're not talking about eternal truth or absolute truth or ultimate truth. We're talking about impermanent, transient human truth. I don't expect you people to be capable of truth, but God damn it, at least you're capable of self-preservation. And I said, why me? And the voice said, because you're on television, dummy. You have 40 million Americans listening to you, and after this show, you could have 50 million. For Pete's sake, I'm not asking you to walk the land in sackcloth and ashes preaching the Armageddon. You're on TV, man. So I thought about it for a moment. And then I said, okay. And this is the transition. And we're in Max's office, and Max says, Howard, I'm taking you off the air. I think you're having a, a breakdown and require treatment. And... Howard's response is poetic and detached and soft and frankly, for anyone who's been on acid, it sounds like he's describing a drug trip. <laughs> um, he says, This is not a psychotic episode. This is a cleansing moment of clarity. I'm imbued, Max. I'm imbued with some special spirit. It's not a religious feeling at all. It's a shocking eruption of great electrical energy. I feel vivid and flashing as if suddenly I'd been plugged into some great electromagnetic field. I feel connected to all living things, to flowers, birds, all the animals of the world, and even to some great unseen living force what i think the hindus call prana that sounds like a drug trip i mean if anyone <laughs> um, speak for yourself <laughs> I, i'm pretty sure i just did um, and he says it's it not a breakdown i've never felt more orderly in my life it is a shattering and beautiful sensation it is the exalted flow of the space-time continuum, save that it is spaceless and timeless and of such loveliness. I feel on the verge of some great ultimate truth. And again, mm -hmm. I don't know how you make anyone makes this movie, because this is he just went on a poetic rant that is so, and the language of it is, beautiful. It, it's beautiful, mm -hmm. but it's also, there are a lot of people that had to get their dictionaries out to go, what the hell was he talking about? Mm -hmm. um, and we just, he says it, and then there's this moment, the other producer uh, has come in, and Max looks over at him, and Howard sees that Max looked over at him, and the look is clearly like, this guy is crazy. Mm -hmm. It's the you're crazy look, and he sees it, and suddenly he becomes paranoid and says, And you will not take me off the air for now or for any other spaceless time. And then he passes out. I want to ask you this. Yes. How much is Howard in control of this in his mind? I think that is like the most uh, the same question because the pass out happens. It's a gimmick. It ends up becoming a gimmick. That's what I think by too. the end of the movie and before he gets killed. But he does this at the end of these bursts of energy and bursts of truth that are coming out of his mouth. He then passes out. So the question is: Is this a gimmick of his to get what he wants, or is this like is is this a psychotic break? And it is how it's manifesting itself. I wonder. My answer is yes. <laughs> that he's in control. No, oh, my answer is it's both. Mm. Is that I and I don't know the I mean like I think he's a totally unknowable character, frankly. That's I think a fair he point. is he's going through stuff. Yeah. I think he is having these moments of clarity, of mental He believes he is having these moments. I think things are happening in his brain that right. were not happening in his brain a month before. Right. Fair. I, I, I think he is feeling all sorts of stuff, but I also think that he's a showman. Mm -hmm. You know? The desire to be on air. Who doesn't have that ego who works in front of a camera, right? This desire to, there's some 
I, I have to believe that there's some level of importance that says I must be on camera to speak this stuff, to talk about this stuff. Like I can deliver this, I can do this. And I feel like he has that, especially amongst the main anchors, the, the high anchors, sure. right? Uh, so I wonder if that's part of it too, this desire to be back on television. It seems to me there's this contradiction because on the one hand, he goes on as an anchorman and he's speaking bullshit. But on the other hand, audiences listen to him as if he is a visionary and a seer mm. and really knows the truth and he's laying it out on the news and it's got to be the news and we care about the news and it's truth and that's what we're getting. So there's this, once again, this contradiction that is so much a part of his character, his his experience, mm. that you really feel it. Well, and I think too, like humans exist in this you know, field of rewards of positive and negative consequences. Yeah. And so he's giving the news that he thinks is bullshit and his ratings are going down. And then he cries bullshit and people are suddenly interested. And the more crazed he becomes, the more people are hanging on his every word. Mm. And I mean, I'm sure we've all seen people in our various industries where they always believe they're a special person. And then when the universe comes back and says, you are special, then that allows them to become more of this version of themselves for positive and negative reasons. Yeah. And so like he, I think, I mean, I think he is having a breakdown on some level, mm -hmm. but I also think he's using the breakdown, you know, it is reinforcing a vision of himself that he really likes, yeah. which is as the angry prophet, you know, decrying the hypocrisies of our time. Well, you, of course you like it. Yeah. And, and when people uh, treat you that way, you feel you have to act accordingly yep. and you don't want it to stop that's for sure like most televangelists so so max takes howard back to his place he's lying on the couch there we hear thunder and lightning and uh whether thunder and lightning become important like this is the religious significance of this thing mm -hmm. and he's tossing and turning and then he gets up and uh the next morning uh, Max's wife, which is Beatrice Strait, who won the Academy Award for her role in this for really? two scenes. Really? What? Oh my God. Yep. I did not know that. Best supporting I didn't actress. either, and she says, but such a small... Wow. Yep. Oh, just, yep. Wow, two scenes. She gets up. She notices Howard's hmm. gone. She comes back. By the way, one little touch. Movies are always about little tiny details. When she gets out of bed, she covers Max back up with the covers. Hmm. It's totally small. But you know so much about who this person is by yeah. that gesture of yeah. care for this person yeah. when she gets up and she comes back and she says, Wake up, Max, because Howard's gone. And now there is a panic. What do you mean you don't know where he is? The son of a bitch is a hit, God damn it! Over 2,000 phone calls! Go down to the mailroom. As of this minute, over 14,000 telegrams. The response is sensational. Herb telling. Max Herb's phone hasn't cover. stopped ringing. Every goddamn affiliate from Albuquerque to Sandusky, the response is sensational. And Duvall is hilarious in this scene. Oh, my God. He is just he is just manic and crazed and angry. He should be jumping off a roof for all I know. The man is insane. He's not responsible for himself. He needs care and treatment. And all you grave robbers think about is that he's, I hit and Diane's response is, maybe he's imbued. Maybe he is really, you know, he says he's having a religious thing. Yeah. Maybe it's true. Who of us is qualified to say no? <laughs> Which, coming from, coming from, from the Senate. Yeah, right. It's perfect. <laughs> you know, sure, maybe he is. And then her description, which I love, is she says, even if he's as mad as Moses. Yeah. Now, I think that is a fascinating line. Yeah. Because contained within that line is, I think all religion is insane. Right. Sure. <laughs> Moses was insane. Sure. So maybe he's just as mad as him, <laughs> which of course for her would be great. And Max goes, no, I'm not putting him back on the air. And Diane's response is, it's not your show anymore, Max. It's mine. I gave her the show, Schumacher. I'm putting the network news show under programming. Uh, Mr. Ruddy has had a mild heart attack and is not taking calls. In his absence, I'm making all network decisions including one I've been wanting to make a long time. You're fired. And I love William Holden's quiet, strong, and somewhat dangerous dignity in this scene mm. is great. Well, let's say fuck you, Hackett. You want me out of here, you're going to have to drag me out kicking and screaming and the whole news division kicking and screaming with me. He does the threat. You want me out of here, you're going to have to drag me kicking and screaming and the entire news division apparently is going to come with him. No, they're not. And the simplicity of Duval is like, I think in this recession, they're going to go with you. You're out of your mind. <laughs> There's a great Duval moment where he's standing up to Schumacher and he says, and, I, and I'll just cut to the quote because I can't do it. I got to hit Schumacher and Ruddy doesn't count anymore. 
He was hoping I'd follow my face with this Beale show, but I didn't. It's a big, fat, big titted hit, and I don't have to waffle around with Ruddy anymore. Only Duvall could say that line like that. <laughs> Nobody yells better than Duvall and Phil. <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> Nobody. It's so, it, it doesn't overwhelm you, but it's so pointed. And his body arches over when he yells. <laughs> like he's, I'm going to tell you something right now. And it becomes this, right? And it's fantastic to watch. Nobody does it better than him. I love the fact that the news director, the news department rather, yeah. just won't go along. You know, yeah. they can't, they can't do it. There for so many reasons. And, and, uh, and none of them really recognizes, I think, what's going on yeah. around them either. And uh, he asks if Diane is going along with this. And she's like, look, I wanted to work with you on this. <laughs> and his response is, well, let's just say, fuck you too, honey. And she takes it. Because it's not the first time she's heard it. Yeah. yeah. Certainly. And so she rolls with it. And and Max makes his exit. And after he's gone, in a quiet moment, Hackett turns to Diane and says, something going on between you and Schumacher? Not anymore. <laughs> it's great. Yep. Problem is, still can't find Howard. He is walking in the rain, in the pajamas, with the raincoat. He comes into the lobby of the news building, and the guard says, What do you do, Mr. Beale? I must make my witness. Sure thing, Mr. Beale. He's got that smirk on his face, too, when he's closing the door of the, dar the guard, because he's like, man, this guy's crazy. Well, here's the thing. So Lamette <laughs> talked about this moment a lot, and I think this is key to the movie, mm. which is that when he originally directed it, Lumette had the guard do a big reaction to, oh my God, this guy's crazy. Right. Like a big, you're crazy reaction. And Patty ran up to him and said, that's not the joke. He has to not have a big reaction. He has to not really react to him. Right. And Lumet didn't understand it at first, and then went, oh, that's the whole movie. If the guard reacts to, to Howard Beale like he's an insane person, right. Then the, the the joke is Howard Beale is crazy. Yeah. If the guard doesn't react that much, then the joke is the world is crazy. Hmm. And two, the audience has bought into mm -hmm. what is being what it's being told. Yeah, hmm. that's exactly right. Um, and we're in the control room, and they're totally unprepared for him. He walks in, still in the raincoat, still in the pajamas, hair still wet. <laughs> they're trying to make him up as we're going from another news story, which is Gerald Ford or something like that, going on. And they cut to Howard, and here we are. This is one of the great speeches in the history of yeah. Hollywood. There's so much in this scene, in this monologue, and it just starts with saying a truth that maybe is news. I don't have to tell you things are bad. Everybody knows things are bad. It's a depression. Everybody's out of work or scared of losing their job. The dollar buys a nickel's worth. Banks are going bust. Shopkeepers keep a gun under the counter. Punks are running wild in the street, and there's nobody anywhere who seems to know what to do, and there's no end to it. How often do we feel like that? I think so many people feel like that, that we now have a political system that is brought to us mm. by an electorate uh, for exactly those kinds of sentiments and those kinds of reasons, and that's what is appealed to by the current the president of the United States. That's yeah. a great point. Warren. Yeah, they mm. adjust their message to fit that mentality sure. that all this stuff is happening. You're powerless. Sure. They're trying to take everything away from you. What are you going to do about it? Fight, 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 and f and don't worry about morals or principles or racism or bigotry or misogyny. Fight. Get what you want. Well, and, and this idea of it seems like everything's going crazy. And we are terrible as a people to fall into that trap. And that scares me more. The electorate does what it does. It's the people that really, that respond to it and decide the direction. Well, this is the thing that Diane is talking about that she understood, and obviously Patty Chayefsky understood, which is having someone to articulate the popular mm -hmm. rage. Mm -hmm. Is that everybody in the, in the, in the button down pre Howard Beale world was, you had the reporter saying, you know, that's the way it is. Mm. And he was calm and he was reasonable and he was um, dependable and he did not articulate the common rage. And Howard Beale comes on and says, We know the air is unfit to breathe and our food is unfit to eat. We sit watching our TVs while some local newscaster tells us that today we had 15 homicides and 63 violent crimes as if that's the way it's supposed to be. We know things are bad, worse than bad. 
They're crazy. It's like everything everywhere is going crazy, so we don't go out anymore. We sit in the house, and slowly the world we're living in is getting smaller, and all we say is, please, at least leave us alone in our living rooms. Let me have my toaster and my TV and my steel-belted radios, and I won't say anything. Just leave us alone. You know, we talk about this being prescient, and it wasn't this, it wasn't that long after this film that Ronald Reagan came along, mm. and one of the things that is <clears throat> most often said about Ronald Reagan and the reason that he was successful is that he was able to articulate grievances, mm. Mm. and he was able to do it, of course, in an extraordinarily effective way, yeah. and that's what made him president of the United States, first governor, then president. He was good at it. Well, and he did this weird thing, which was to say to really point at various evils, you know, things that he perceived as evils, yeah. um, whether it was Russians or crime or whatever it was, but also to be calming in a way and say, it's going to be okay, Yeah, you know? He did that. <clears throat> Plus, he also managed to articulate the grievances in a very persuasive manner, saying, you know, the worst, however many l words it is in the English language are... I'm from the, the government, government and I'm here to, here to help. <laughs> and this is such a, a wonderfully uh, effective mm. right. line and a way to appeal to that grievance without appearing to do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things we see in the course of this scene is the reactions, particularly from Faye Dunaway, because now he has become the thing that he she wants him to come because he says, Well, I'm not going to leave you alone. I want you to get mad. And then here's the section that I've been thinking about that I never thought about before. I don't want you to protest. I don't want you to write. I don't want you to write to your congressman because I wouldn't know what to tell you to write. I don't know what to do about the depression and the inflation and the Russians and the crime in the street. All I know is that first, you've got to get mad. You've got to say, I'm a human being. God damn it. My life has value. And again, the reactions from, from Faye Dunaway are incredible. But this is the thing I've been thinking about. First, you got to get mad. Mm. I think first you got to get mad is where we are in the world today. And it is so destructive because he isn't offering any solutions. He doesn't know what to do. Mm. He says, first you got to get mad. And if you turn on whichever network of your persuasion you want, they're starting with first you got to get mad. The point is anger. And if you're on Facebook or you're on Twitter, mm. all of those things are exploiting first you got to get mad. And if you look at the algorithms on YouTube, they are pulling you to get mad because get mad keeps you activated, keeps you there, but you don't fucking do anything you know and that our mad the little mad button on our adrenal gland has gotten punched over and over and over again and we're just these burning balls of madness walking around mm -hmm. but we're not solving any problems on the other hand people say that the only reason or the only way that effective social change ever happens is when enough people get mad to actually do something true it's just what's second First, you got to get mad, sure. And what change are you going to make? Yeah. You know, yeah. You, what direction are you going to go? That's what's so dangerous. Mm. The op there are options. Well, the direction Howard Beale wants you to go right now is to get up. <laughs> so, I want you to get up now. I want all of you to get up out of your chairs. I want you to get up right now and go to the window, open it, and stick your head out and yell... I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore. Take this anymore. This was not, surprising. Yeah. yeah. I thought it was mad as hell, I'm not going to take it anymore. But it's this anymore, mm. over and over again. Yeah. And I myself was like, oh, oh, the quote's been wrong all these years in my head. Oh. I had no idea. The use of language, the effectiveness mm -hmm. of the language, just even in a, in a word like that. Yeah, because it point. is singular. This is m more expansive. What is this? Well, this is in my oh. world circumstance, like right. what I am in. Yes, right. totally. Right point. And Diane's reaction immediately is, "How many stations is this going out to?" <laughs> we hear it's sixty-seven. And she runs out of the room. She goes uh, down the hallway, and Howard Beale has gotten up. He's gotten up from the news anchor desk, and you see the director going, "Stay with him, stay with him." And you see the camera pulling back <laughs> so as great. as technicians are scrambling to move the cables, and the wall is opening up, and the camera's moving. He's off the set, and he is yelling right at that camera, repeating over and over again, "I'm mad as hell." Then we'll figure out what to do about the depression and the inflation and the oil crisis. But first, get up out of your chairs, open the window, stick your head out and yell and say, I'm as mad as hell and I'm not going to take this anymore. And then we see that Max, no longer with a job, is sitting home with his family watching this on TV. And Faye Dunaway's on the phone calling up uh, Atlanta and they're screaming in Atlanta. Shut up! 
and back with Max and his daughter. And his daughter gets up and walks to the window. And he's going, what are you doing? And she says, I want to see if anybody's yelling. And Max, of course, shakes his head because he's sure that no one, no one be yelling, obviously. She opens up the window and there we hear the first yell. I'm mad as hell. And Max gets up to walk to the window. And now we're on this street, and this is a real street in New York. They had to spend all day lighting this. This is actually a really complicated shoot because of all these extras in all these different places that are all on different walkie-talkies that have to pop out their heads at different moments and start uh, yelling. You have a complicated lighting scheme, including uh, lightning effects that are going to happen. Uh, and it was all shot in one night, and we hear the whole neighborhood start yelling, I'm mad as hell. And Max listens to it as it builds into this tremendous cacophony. And then he slowly closes the window. There are some speeches in film which have moved beyond the screen and lodged themselves into the public consciousness. Tyler Durden and the Rules of Fight Club. Robin Williams telling his students to seize the day. Mel Gibson in blue paint screaming about freedom. And George C. Scott standing in front of that American flag and explaining what war really is. But for me, there is no film speech so powerful, articulate, and so incredibly prescient as Howard Beale in that wet raincoat, screaming that he is mad as hell and he's not going to take this anymore. It is a moment of shattering, honest rage, and one that echoes throughout film history and still has things to teach us about the world we see around us today. And the truth is, I can't think of a better place to end part one of our exploration of Patty Chayefsky's network. John and I would like to thank our very special guest, Warren Olney, for all his great insights. And as always, if you have comments, you can find us on Facebook at The Cinephiles. If you want to buy Network or any film we've ever done, just visit our website, cinephiles.net. Please subscribe to us on iTunes, on YouTube, Stitcher, Google Play, or anywhere else you get podcasts. And leave a comment on YouTube, reviews on iTunes. You can support the show on patreon.com slash the cinephiles. And as always, you can reach me on Twitter at SR Morris, on Instagram at SR Morris One. And John, you can reach both places at The Roca Says. That's it for this week. We will be back next week to conclude our exploration of Patty Chayefsky's network. <laughs>